Hello, I'm Professor Simon Hazlitt and in this video I'd like to say a little bit about um, how to collect, analyse and process material to look for radiolaria. Now radiolaria are marine uh, microplankton, they're single celled organisms, they're protozoa that live in the sea uh, in the marine environment uh, floating around in the water column. Now um, they have a very long geological record, they extend right back to the earliest Paleozoic um, but they're very abundant in the modern oceans and because of that we can use them in the geological record, in geological studies to piece together um, environmental change in the oceans through time and they also have a, a, a role in helping us to date sediments as well, date rocks because they evolve through time and as they evolve new species appear and we can use those first appearances of different species to help us date the rocks in which they occur. So they have a dual role really in, um, in geology and in geoscience. One is a dating tool and the other to help us understand environmental change. But how do we actually look at them and, and collect them? Well. Because they're marine uh, organisms, uh, we can either find them in the, in the sea, living today in the plankton, uh, and we can use plankton nets that, that are towed behind boats and ships and so on to actually collect living specimens um, and, uh, and look at those. And that's quite useful in helping us to uh, understand the modern distribution and the modern ecology of radial area, which helps us then to understand what they mean when we find them in the fossil record. Um, but also when they die, obviously they're floating around in the plankton in the water column when they're alive, but when they die they sink to the bottom of the sea and become uh, uh, accumulate in, in sediments and become fossils if the preservational conditions are, are right. Now we can look at them on the sea surf, top of the sea bed on the surface sediments simply by lowering um, a, a line with a, with a bucket, a grab sampler um, from the back of a ship and, and taking samples from the seabed. Now that's quite useful because we are able to map the distribution of uh, radial area across the seabed right around the world and, and that's, that has been done to some extent by various different sort of expeditions if you like. Um, uh, but also if we want to then start looking at uh, radial area and how they, where they occur in sediments of different times we will then have to use coring techniques uh, on the seabed to actually penetrate the seabed, go into the older sediments that are underneath the surface, and then we can uh, retrieve cores um, from the seabed that we can then uh, subsample uh, and, and look at the radial area in there. But of course, because radial area have been around for such a long time, um, many marine uh, sediments that were in very old oceans. Uh, going back uh, into, into older geological periods, some of those oceans have actually gone now. They've, cl they've, been, they've closed and those marine sediments are now um, form mountains such as in the Himalayas and the Alps. Um, and so we can find radial area fossils uh, occurring in rocks that we can find in these mountainous regions such as the, such as the Alps and the Himalayas. And so we can um, extract the radial area from those rocks to tell us a little bit about what those oceans were like when they existed. So there's various ways in which we can, uh, where we can, various places we can find radial area um, and, and, wh and where they occurred uh, will influence the, the types of collection processes, um, te collection techniques and, and extraction processes that we might use. Now in order to um, uh, obtain uh, sediments from the bottom of the sea this often uh, uh, requires a sort of international efforts, if you like, because ships uh, that are able to uh, core the seabed are very expensive and the, and the equipment used is very expensive. And in fact, there's been a number of international programs being set up to core the ocean basins. And radiolarian studies has really flourished since, that, since, since these programs have been established um, to look like, like many different types of fossils to look at them in, in, the, in the sediment cores that are retrieved. Now the first major international uh, program was uh, the deep sea drilling program. Now the deep sea drilling program was established in the 1960s and uh, went through to the late 1980s and each leg of the voyage 
of their ship, the Glomar Challenger, um, which went out and collected sediment uh, from, the, from various sites right around the globe. Um, the results of all of those uh, legs were published in these um, reports of the Deep Sea Drilling Project. So this was the first um, major international program that went out and collected material from the deep sea and radial area um, and other fossil groups like foraminifera as well, the, 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 their study and use in, in oceanography and paleo-oceanography really took off once these um, projects were, this project was underway. Now that changed um, in, the, in the 1980s um, into what became known as the Ocean Drilling Program. Now the Ocean Drilling Program uh, didn't just focus on the deep sea like the deep sea uh, drilling project did. This also looked at the continental shelves, uh, which was a little, which was a, a, a departure. Um, the reason why the deep sea drilling project really didn't look at continental shelves was because the the, the, the controversy that there might ar might arise because of um, hydrocarbon exploration and, and the search for petroleum and oil. Um, but the ocean drilling program then started to look at continental shelves as well. And this program, again, like the DSDP before it, published each of its the findings from each of its legs in these uh, books, the Proceedings of the Ocean Drilling Program. Um, and again, they uh, have, have uh, drilled holes right around the, the world's ocean seabeds. Now, this project, sorry, this program had a different ship. It had a new ship called the Joides Resolution. And this operated from uh, the, the late 1980s um, into the late 1990s and, and, and also into the very early part of the 21st century, when the ocean drilling program was then superseded by um, the integrated in ocean drilling program, which is the, most, this is the latest incarnation, if you, if you like, of this series of programs that have been set up and um, undertaken since the uh, 1960s. But even before that, and during that period, um, institutions uh, around the world have had their own smaller drilling projects as well. Uh, for example, the uh, Swedish deep sea uh, drilling exp expedition um, from the 1950s is one of the first major uh, institutional uh, projects. Um, but also uh, institutions like the Scripps um, Oceanographic Institution in San Diego have, have done several of their own. And I, indeed, I've worked on, on some of their material. So we have got a very good coverage of material from, from the deep sea from these various different uh, drilling programs. Now, what do we do with that material? Well, um, the material that's collected by these programs uh, are taken and stored in repositories um, where scientists can uh, gain access to them to study them and so on. There is an initial study of this material on, on board the ships during, for the ocean drilling program for example, were two month cruises, um, but the, the cores go back to a repository and then scientists from around the world, like myself, can actually uh, request that material to look at.